And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, the head honcho of the world of the gooey cube, and the, and the man who is, spearhead, who is spearheading the... Enthralling adventures and incredible world ser series of camp series of campaigns. The one and only Alphineus Goo. How you doing tonight, uh -huh. man? <laughs> Hello, Mildra. Good to see you this evening. I uh, I'm wondering though. I am sitting here, you know, at the bar, and I haven't been served yet. So let us uh, let us hurry up and see some wine. <laughs> wine? Are you kidding? <laughs> well, I am a wizard. <laughs> what do you want me to drink? Ale? Ugh. <laughs> Um, we've, we've got, well, we've got Kalia, if that'll help. <laughs> what about mead? No, listen, yep. actually, I'm just kidding. I don't mind a good, a good ale. I'm a good ale person, too. Yep. So, I'm fairly much an equal opportunity in Biber, mm -hmm. just uh, within moderation, of course. Yeah. Um, but give, given where I come from and given how I've done my fair share of pub crawls, um, no, wine isn't, wine isn't going to be really much of a thing isn't really much of a thing in the te in the temple it's mo it's more about it's more about mead a ale any any kind of stout any kind of um bitter and of course also and of course ideally all served in steins well of course <laughs> you got to have a proper stein that's exactly right mm -hmm. especially a tall one with mm -hmm. lots of width <laughs> yeah um i'm pretty sure if i didn't have it i'm pr i'm pretty sure every dwarf with an earshot would be putting me in the book of grudges <laughs> of course they would <Yeah>. be. <laughs> so, with that with that in mind, and I do want to congratulate you for s just smashing the um, goal that you had set for this particular project. How did? What was your introduction to the wonderful, weird, and wacky world of role playing games? Well, you you must understand. I uh, I've been around for a long time, so mm -hmm. I. Uh, I, uh, when I was young, I uh, was introduced to the, the white box, the famed white box, yes, mm -hmm. and uh, played a little bit of that. And then sometime after that, uh, uh, the second edition was published. Mm -hmm. And this was a big deal at that time, you know, the second edition that came out and, you know, and, you know a d and d is what they called it, right? So, mm -hmm. so then we, we began playing this marvelous game and you know we all just played and played and played and played you know almost every day during the summers you know and then mm -hmm. regularly during the weeks you know while we were in school and um carried into college and and all of that stuff and and i've just uh, i've been a player and a collector and and more than that a game master for the most part uh, for somewhere around 40 years and um and it is it is for me. Uh, it is the greatest, the greatest game that was ever made, and and the reason why is that unlike most other games, it, this is truly played in your imagination, right? It is it's truly played on the on the screen of your mind, and uh, and not only that, it is it is also created by you while you are playing it. So this is really, you know, for me, why it is is so captivating. Mm -hmm. So forty years, I guess, is the the answer, and beginning with the white box, <laughs> which um, at the very at the very least, by starting with something like the white box, I don't have to, I don't have to narrow down which ver which version of original that that it is, because there's been times where I've had to say, okay, is that the Moldave version? Is that the, did you start with Moldave? Did you start with Cook? Did you start with Beckme? <laughs> but here it's just I can keep it just pure and simple, white box. Yeah, the white box. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and there were other games being played at that time that had come yeah. out, you know, trying to compete with them, Tunnels and Trolls, and mm -hmm. uh, let me see, um, I think it was uh, it was uh, uh, Roll Master uh, came out around that time, and uh, oh yeah, Gerps. Charts for Days, yes, and I can't remember when Gerps, when, I can't remember when Gerps came out. Gerps was eighties. Yeah, it was after. It was a little after. It was mm -hmm. a little behind. Um. Of course, the marvelous empire of the of the, um, of the petal throne mm -hmm. uh, 
was out uh, in that in that range. And of course, there was Judges Guild, and they were making all these marvelous things. You know, this this amazing city called the City State of the Invincible Overlord, or the mm-hmm. City State of the World Emperor. These two magnificent cities, and of course, that was the time that uh, that Dave Arneson came out with his little Blackmore stuff through uh, through Judges Guild. It was mm-hmm. it was it was amazing time, you know, and and um, and and we you know we who had who didn't have computer games right or mm uh massive multiplayer you know mmo rgs or mmo prs or whatever the frick they're called right um yeah. massive multiplayer whatever you know um they, we didn't have any of that mm-hmm. right i mean we had pong right yeah. we had pong <laughs> although um <laughs> now i now I do remember doing research on on the early days when it came when it came to trying to do computer RPGs, and um, that was how I did discover the um, the Plato servers, which were very er- which um, that was in um, in the mid to late in the uh, mid to late seventies. Although it w- although not everybody had access to that kind of thing. Um, then a few years after that, there were there was there was stuff like muds that. Came, that came about, and M- Mud being based on a unlicensed port of Zork, which is where the yeah, term Mud yeah, comes from. Zork, Zork, I remember mm-hmm. actually playing a form of Zork yep. when I was in um, elementary school. So that mm-hmm. would have been the late '60s, early '70s, mm-hmm. and um, and it, I don't know it was officially Zork, but it was sort of like that, right? I sort of remember the Gru thing and all that stuff. And there was also a, a, a form of a Star Trek game. And we went to the uh, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, uh, mm-hmm. the Lawrence Hall of Science in mm-hmm. uh, in Berkeley. And I remember playing uh, playing on those. And that was when computers were, were, were uh, programmed by cards, right? You put in those cards, mm-hmm. and uh, and they would go kind of through. And that was how that was how they worked. So the first computer game that I remember that was actually something that you could play on a computer was in the late 70s and i, I want to say it might have been the might have been right at the cusp it was late 70s mm-hmm. was wizardry yes and yes. do you do you remember what i'm talking about yes uh, I, yes i do um and i and i remember re, uh, now um i if i if i if it weren't for if it weren't for how many times i've jumped around i do remember having a notebook full of my own little um notes and t- and attempts to do map making when it came to um, proving grounds of the Mad Overlord. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. And although what I ended up finding out is wizardry became a much bigger deal in Europe and Japan than it did in the states. In fact, wizardry would lay the groundwork for the um, J- for Japan to do their to do their own versions like the Black Onyx, mm-hmm. which yeah was basically yeah, a just, knockoff of, was... of um, wizardry. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was, anyway, the point mm-hmm. being that in those days, that's all we had, you know, yeah. and, and there was no graphics, there was no, no real depth of, of imagination that was in there, you know, it was sort of just, you know, click and move, right? And so when you think about putting yourself in that kind of a, of a, of a circumstance, and then all of a sudden, a role playing game comes to life, you can imagine how captivating it is, you know, it's just, compared to today which obviously they have taken off again and i think i know why but uh but at that time it was like it was revolutionary it was just it was mind blowing mm-hmm. and i know when it, i know that i know that some have been bl- have pinned current events for the for the rise of virtual tabletop and um pe- and people using that i've argued that that was going to happen in, in, inevitably it was just it was just that recent events um, accelerated the matter. Now, when it came, when it came to now, I asked um, James E. Jackson about about this when I when I had him on. But when it came to the when it came to the concept of do, of doing these pa- doing these package based um, modules, how did that idea start? Well, so. What what you see in one of our boxes, mm-hmm. um, and obviously you know, incredibly different than most people's paradigm of what a purchased adventure is, right? The, the, yes. the paradigm yeah. is a little magazette, right, with a couple of maps in the back, or a mm-hmm. or a perfect bound book, right? Um, yeah. yeah. 
And what I wanted to, to create was a, an adventure that would make a game master's life just considerably easier while it also made the, the adventure, the game, far more enthralling for players. And so, you know, through the years, you, you've game master hundreds, perhaps thousands, probably thousands of games, mm -hmm. you know, through the years. And, um, and you start seeing what other people do and you look at, at other ideas and you watch videos and, you know, you do these things and, and you begin to have your own style, right? The things you do at your table. And I, I like props, I like handouts, I like visuals. I think they really help uh, to, to make a, uh, a, a better feeling for, of being there. You know what I'm saying? Um, this is not to say that I, that I don't like theater of the mind, I, I do. I just think that, that showing an image, one image just helps to spawn the imagination or spur the imagination more. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've lived, I love to use uh, images of people uh, for non-player characters because it uh, it not only helps cement that person uh, in the minds of the players, but it also helps uh, you in terms of having an image. It helps you to recall them and be able to role play them and all that stuff. And so there's just a whole lot of little things. Uh, I hated the fact that Perfect Bound books, you had to flip back and forth mm -hmm. to go to the back for the combats or, mm -hmm. you know, you tried to lay them flat. They'd slam shut on you behind your screen. You'd be screwed up. You have to put all these little post-it notes in there and all these things you have to do. And so, you know, we have a we have an adventure books that has the, all the adventure in there. And then we have the GM's book. Both of them are spiral bound so you can lay them flat. And the, the encounters and events are sort of in the GM's book and they correspond to the adventure book. So you, you don't have to flip none of that flipping and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I, I didn't like the fact that, um, you know, I felt like uh, even though I, I there was some part of me that liked making the players map, they always seem mm -hmm. to screw it up. And um, and so tracing paper and graph paper and these kinds of things kind of mm -hmm. felt uh, kind of passe to me and they didn't feel immersive. And so I tried to over the years, I figured out how to be able to make a map that was really beautiful and really immersive. And then I could use uh, black sticky notes to put over the top of them. So we had fog of war. So the players could actually experience a full color map with all of the interesting things that were in the rooms and all of that stuff. And mm -hmm. I, did, I didn't like putting, uh, uh, writing down magic items on post-it notes or telling people what the stats were. And then, you know, five games later, they couldn't remember the stats or they lost their note or whatever. So, you know, so we put magic item cards in, in, in all of the boxes. And th there's just a lot of, of nuances that I think most game masters like you would say, wow, that's cool, and I thought of that. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Um, and what? And obviously, the thing, the thing that, um, the thing that drew me in when it came to when it came to this project is, I am a self admitted sucker for box sets in RPGs. Um, that like that was how, that was how that was how I got started was one was. Was what was the was a um, starter set for the latter days of AD and D Second Edition, mm -hmm. and I remember it. There's other games that I've that I've enjoyed that have presented themselves in box sets, like say Shatter Zone, which, admittedly, is interesting. I would I'd say that I'd say that um, the Master Book system from West End Games was the was the redheaded stepchild of that company, um, but. Th but um through 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 those particular affairs it w i like the idea of having this c total package and then i'd l now unfortunately because of when i started out a lot of the uh, more interesting box sets from the ad and d days were already out of print and some of them i had to i had to bend over backwards to try and get but there were but there were um there were a couple. There were a couple box sets that I do. I do remember. Ha I do remember having and having way too much fun with. Um, I think one of them was a Alquadim setting. Mm -hmm. I have it. I know exactly what you're speaking of. And the other one was Spelljammer. Uh huh. Yes, absolutely. So, given those, I think. I think it's. Um, I think. I think it's fair to say where some of my interests interest lay when it came to doing um campaign settings it's not that it's not that i don't enjoy tra traditional fantasy but um i don't like i 
I've always got I've always gone on the note the note that don't dip in the Tolkien melting pot because nobody goes to fondue parties anymore. <laughs> well the thing is, here's the deal. Mm -hmm. For me, what I want is I want to bring I want to bring an immersive experience. Mm -hmm. I want when the players are sitting around the table, I want them to be like, whoa. I, I'm here and this is really creepy or whoa, this is really mysterious or whoa, what the heck is going on, right? I want mm -hmm. them to be in that place and feel like their their characters are sort of really a part of the, of the of the adventure. And so many people, you know, you see it on the internet all the time. Mm -hmm. I don't understand how come my players build dice towers and they, they don't seem to be paying attention and they're on their phones and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that, that the reason is that, that just simply there's, there's not a great sort of how do you really be a, a really good game master there's not yeah. there's nothing out there there's lots and lots of videos and and some people have done some marvelous things you know trying to instruct folks but but then most of them are you know sort of talking heads and and that gets a little hard on you know people you know who have shorter attention spans and and those kinds of things and and the reality is the best teacher is doing not yes. not yeah. watching right and and then people, of course, have these unrealistic expectations because they watch these sort of reality game playing uh, shows, which are mm -hmm. wonderful. I mean, they're entertaining, they're mm -hmm. enjoyable, they're marvelous. But, you know, all of the people there are, you know, voice actors and skilled people. And, and, and you know, it's, you know it's, more, it's more Hollywood than it is sort of sitting around the table gaming, right? Yeah. And, but, but I really believe that for a game master who, who wants to take their game to the next level, whether they be someone who's been game mastering for 20 years or someone who is new, mm -hmm. if they take up one of our boxes and they read our house, our house rules and philosophy mm -hmm. and they look at sort of the ideas that are in there and they sort of follow sort of the, 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 the concepts and the, and the sort of the, 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 the vision of it, right? Mm -hmm. I honest to goodness believe that they will, they will run a better game. I'm yeah. getting enough... Yeah. Enough feedback now from from enough people that that I believe that is that is fairly true. Now, when it come now, um, my I should now when it comes to this next question, I will I do have to go a bit into the method to my madness as a as a longtime DM. Um, I am very very hands on to the point where um, do doing character creation. Feels fifty percent like filling in the character sheet, and fifty percent like I'm do like I'm like I'm somebody shrank doing an interview. <laughs> um, yes, I understand. The only the only the only thing that the, the only difference in, in the matter is the fact that I don't have them laying on a couch. Um, although maybe maybe I should maybe I should fix that and make that and make that into a sketch the next time I'm at a convention. Um, <laughs> con, um, conf, confessions confessions of a GMing shrink. <laughs> um but a lot of time a lot of times I the reason why I do the whole asking constant questions is it's more of a, an attempt to ease someone into moving from the whole, moving from the idea of what they might want to do into a fully realized thing cuz I'll usually say okay okay What's this is the kind of setting that we're doing? What would you want to be? What would you want to be in that? And I, I don't even t I tell them don't even look at the um, sheet, don't look at the book. Just get just give me something that that pops in your head. You know, like a Rorschach test. And then once they give me that, I I start asking questions based on that, or say, okay, okay, I see what you're going, but but would you? Do you think it would fit more or less if we if we went with what if the, if we went with Y instead of necessarily X? And it just builds from there. Um, when it comes to that sort of questionnaire based based approach and going that level of hands on, um, in the adventures that you have, would there be material to um, support that? Not in terms of what questions to ask, but just in the general, just in a general um, bridging the gap. Sure. No, it's a great question. So, um, and it's got a it's got a multi layer answer. If you don't mind me. And I, I, I tend to be verbose already, so I apologize in advance if I go too verbose. No, just no worries. <laughs> okay, thank you. I appreciate it, Sir Monk. You are marvelous. Mm -hmm. So, um, first and foremost, long, long ago, I sort of got tired of the of the uh, 
what happens when the characters come from really disparate backgrounds and have really disparate uh, sort of goals and objectives, mm -hmm. uh, because it really becomes hard to craft a tale around all of them that they all enjoy uh, if you've got sort of this, this very chaotic uh, um, character relationship thing. And if you mm -hmm. think about most of the, 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 the good books and the good movies and things like that, there's certain things that happen with the protagonists, if there's a group of them, that, uh, that bind them together. Mm -hmm. And I began to look at that a long time ago, and I began to think, you know what? That's the better way to be. And so I tend to, in session zero, work with my players, not, not disparately from what you do. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, in the Red Star Rising campaign in Chapter 1, we have a bunch of pregens, and I'll talk, mm -hmm. to you, I'll talk about that in a second. Yep. But what I came to believe philosophically was that if you could create your characters at the beginning in session zero with those characters, with those players, right, and, and still giving them you know, room to be able to make their characters the way they want them, but create them with commonality of circumstance, create them with commonality of objective, and even create them with commonality of flaw. So circumstance, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, objective and flaw. If you could, if you could kind of bring all those together, mm -hmm. you. What happened was the characters be, began to really want to be a part of the tale because they felt like their characters were already in it, and there was a reason they were together, and there was a reason why they were sort of bound into this sort of uh, major plot lines and these subplots that are going on. It all sort of began to make sense, and that really began to just. Do away with there, there. There was no more murder hoboism at my mm. tables. Generally, there there weren't people doing really weird stuff that didn't make sense. You know, that just mm. just to be goofy. You know, and all that stuff sort of went away. And as as and what I found also after doing that was that the tale became so much more richer and so much more deep. And all of a sudden, these players are like just enthralled. They're they're following this trail of these many different breadcrumbs that go down different trails, right? But they ultimately come back and conjoin. And you know, I use all kinds of stuff, as you know, about uh, Mildred, the the the, uh, the 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 illusion of choice, uh, mm -hmm. the the um, the the multitude of of choices with only you know three really right the the uh, the the deviants that come back and conjoin right so all of these different methodologies we use at game masters to give the players a good feeling that they're they have self determination but that in some places they just don't and that's just the truth of of good gaming I think mm -hmm. um, so anyway so my point being that absolutely in in many of my games that's how it begins much like what you would do the only thing is I'm going to guide them toward commonality of circumstance, commonality of objective, and some commonality of flaw. I'm going to guide them to that. Yep. So in the Red Star Rising campaign, the characters are all chosen from the Hanata's youth. Mm -hmm. and the Hanata's are traveling folk in, in your realm or in my realm, wherever you wish to put them. And those traveling folk have a commonality of circumstance. They're all part of the troop. They have a commonality of, of objective. Actually, they have multitudes of objectives. One is to help protect the troop and support the troop. Their job is to run security at the carnivals, which the troop runs to make money. And then they have commonality of flaw because virtually every one of them have this, uh, this thing, this affliction called the blood touch. And the blood touch uh, puts them in a position where, where people, frankly, are, are quite bigoted against them. Uh, they are not well treated. They are... Uh, shunned in towns and villages, and yet those same people will come and come to their carnivals and enjoy their carnivals and, and do all that stuff, uh, even though they sort of hold them in contempt. And of course, the Hanatas, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately will will be really kind of the saviors of the world. So it is mm -hmm. it is uh, interesting that the those those who were shunned become the saviors, right? It's mm -hmm. kind of a marvelous little little thing that goes on. Oh yeah. And right. so that that character creation within there. You could definitely use any of the pregens, but you could also create your own character that would work within the Hanatas troop. Sorry about the long answer. I hope no, it was interesting. No worry, no worries. I um, I had kind, I'd kind of counted on um long answers with with some of these. Um, I may, I may, I may. There, as the to quote to quote Hamlet, though this be madness, yet there is method in it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
now you mentioned the pre you mentioned the pregens earlier, and um, I've had a complicated attitude with how a lot of people write pregens in D in D and D and elsewhere. And this is not a um, this is not a new phenomenon when it comes to this. A it a um issue that I a issue that I end up having with a lot with a lot of a lot of the ways that pregens are written is that they just throw out the um sh they just throw out the sheet and n and not give not give any point not give any pointers on uh, on pl on play or what or what you should emphasize what you should emphasize um or so or so on in a lot of pregens it's just a sheet and full stop um what's the approach that you have when it comes to the pregens so uh all of the pregens are created with a um a little backstory for each one of them that mm -hmm. also contains a uh, a nugget for the game master to play with uh with the player directly uh should they choose to explore it that one is not we don't account for that in the adventure that's just mm -hmm. for the the game master and the player to sort of do as a little side thing like a story seed story seed Yes, a little story seed, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then, um, because I also, you know, really believe in building tail around the the player characters, uh, there there are specific sort of uh, roles that are in chapters one and two and even in three that the game master can choose to sort of bestow upon different uh, different ones of different ones of the player characters. And uh, a couple of those roles are, are really, you know, even potentially world impacting, you know, depending on what they do. And so I am definitely sounds like very much in your camp where, you know, we're going to we're going to we're going to talk about a character. We're going to figure out sort of what, what's all going on with that character. We're going to try to build a little bit of of, of idea and backstory and, and sort of help that character be uh, be embraced by the player uh rather than sort of just uh, hey here's your sheet go play so uh so i think we're on on the same page and by the way we have 24 pre-generated characters we put in that chapter one because oh. we really wanted people to have a marvelous uh, set of choices mm -hmm. rather than sort of just there's six and somebody ends up with the one they didn't want yeah I'd, i've um you have no you have no idea how mad i've got how, how mad i've gotten when i've when um i've set up pre-gens at say a um, small time con in my area, and then and then somebody asks, and then somebody asks, okay, who's playing the tank? And uh, I'm tr I'm trying to mean I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying to not be my smart my smart ass self, but um, it's it's like the sh it's like the shoulder devil that that, that just <laughs> keeps poking me. And you know how you know how a lot of people have that shoulder angel that's supposed to remind you of your mo of your morals and to be a good person. Yes, of course. I didn't hear a peep out of that guy. <laughs> I don't. I don't have. I don't have a shoulder angel. I just have a shoulder devil and a worse shoulder devil. <laughs> and I, I had base. I uh, I, and I didn't. I didn't roast the guy. I just said, "Oh, you vo Oh, you volunteered. Okay, you're the tank." <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess he. I guess he was expecting me to be. I guess he was expecting me to be nice or something. And I was being nice. I didn't make. I didn't make him. I didn't make him play the. I didn't make him play the spellcaster who only knows color spray. Right. <laughs> well, that's another thing for me. You know, I like low levels mm -hmm. a lot. Oh yeah, and yeah. for for you know for literally, I'm going to speak the truth now. For for four decades, um, we've played a number of house rules to make low levels fun, and uh, uh, we give uh, first level all first level casters. We give them three, sometimes even four extra first level spell slots that they can have permanently. Um, have never had that impact to the game in the long term. Uh, all it did at the low levels was give casters much more time to play. It gave healers much more healing abilities. And so you just didn't have to rest as much. And um, and that made the low levels more interesting. So we brought that into GUI Cube. And also um, all of our adventures, we are very much objective-based leveling. We are not experience points-based leveling at all. 
and uh, we level slower uh, mm -hmm. than most. And uh, the reason that is, is because, again, philosophically, I just think the lower levels tend to be more fun mm -hmm. generally than the higher levels. Now, that does not mean that I'm not throwing shade on a 15th level campaign or a 17th level campaign. And anybody who's listening, please don't mm -hmm. get the wrong idea. Mm -hmm. I think you can have great games at, at high levels. I just think that they, they're very taxing on a game master. They take, uh, they take a lot of effort on the players. Uh, you know, these characters become so powerful over time. And, uh, and frankly, there's less risk uh, mm -hmm. for their characters that they're actually going to, to lose their characters. And, uh, and that risk is part of the fun of the game, right? The, that risk of, oh my goodness, I could lose my character. Uh, that, uh, that is part of the, the the tenseness that happens, you know, and as they get more and more and more powerful, it gets harder and harder and harder to bring that risk to the table. Mm -hmm. So anyway, my personal belief is that the best levels as they are defined in, in fifth edition are really third through about ninth or 10th, maybe 11th, something like that. But if you do what we do, first and second level are really fun. Mm -hmm. uh, we, 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 we always maxed out on hit points at first level because they're heroes after all. Uh, we always gave those extra spell slots. We sometimes gave a little extra magic at first level. We did a lot of things to make the first and second levels much more enjoyable for the players. And mostly because we remembered when we first were playing how horrible it was to be the spellcaster who cast their one spell. There weren't even cantrips then. Mm -hmm. Cast their one spell and spent the rest of the game throwing darts for the rest of the game. It was just the worst, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so we, uh, we changed that up a long, 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 long time ago and brought that to GUI Cube. And we really think it, it makes it better. Yeah. And when it comes now, um, you mentioned house rules earlier, and this was something that I had that I had um that I had asked James about last week, but um he wasn't able to give me the full the full scope of things. Aside from just adding more stuff for um for for low for low level affairs. Aside, aside from that description, what can you tell me about the more significant changes to d and sandbox through the house rule that, that you guys have? Well, first of all, if anybody wants them, they can uh, go to our... I, I don't think they can do it on our... On our uh, normally, you can go to our GUI Cube website and mm -hmm. go to the shop page and download them for free. Uh, you can also download a couple of free... Um, Three new character classes, and also mm -hmm. download um, our little overview of Zyathe. So there's some freebies there for people who want to do it. But I don't mm -hmm. think right now you can do it at the um, at the GUI Cube website because of the Kickstarter. But if you mm -hmm. go to the Kickstarter and literally scroll down underneath the first sort of opening paragraphs, you can download all four of those things there, including the house rules. Mm -hmm. And the house rules also contains our philosophy, so you can kind of understand sort of why we think the things that we think. Um, but, but we have, uh, uh, fitting of magical armor or sorry, a fitting of armor and, and fitting of magical armor and, mm -hmm. uh, make money easy. I, I long ago got so tired of having to look all this stuff up in the book and there was all these weird outliers, you know, like, so a chicken was a live chicken was a copper piece and a, uh, a, a nail was, you know, a copper piece, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, when I started equating things, you started looking at things, you looked at the cost of a coach in the old days, and you realized all of a sudden that, you know, a lot of these things had very much uh, commonality with our modern day. And um, so we just began equating money with, uh, with dollars. And pretty much it worked. And what we did was we had copper pieces were a dime, silver pieces were a dollar, Electrum pieces were a $10 bill, gold pieces were a $20 bill, and platinum mm -hmm. pieces were a $100 bill. Mm -hmm. And when you started doing the math and you started looking at the cost of a, of, a, of a new car versus the cost of a coach, and you started looking at the cost of a, a live chicken, and you started looking, and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, this, is, this really works, you know? And then we amped it up when you were in a city because it'd be a little more expensive, and we chilled it down when you were in a village where it might be less expensive, and mm -hmm. uh, and it really took all of that looking up of money totally out of the out of the way. You you already heard about our um, our ideas about uh, uh, how do you uh, uh, slow level a little bit and manage leveling and objective based leveling and 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 mm -hmm. why we like low levels and giving spells at, at low levels. You already heard about most of that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, I'm trying to remember. I can't remember what's all in there, but uh, I've got a I've got a thing I do that I really like because 
Uh, I never liked that somebody in a skill check or something like that, where somebody rolls a 20 and they just know for sure. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so someone's going to make a perception check to try to figure out if somebody across the table is bluffing them in a poker game. Right. Yeah. Well, the fact of the matter is even some of the greatest poker players in the world can be pretty damn sure that someone is bluffing them, Mm -hmm. but they don't really know for sure until the cards get laid down. And if you've ever watched the World Series of Poker, you know mm-hmm. that sometimes they aren't bluffing and the guy was wrong, right? Yeah. So I have a I have a little modifier I do for the, mm-hmm. for the skills only. I don't do this for things like traps and, and those kinds of things. I do this mostly for skills, um, riding horses or whatever. They roll mm-hmm. it, they roll their dice, and then I roll behind the screen the modifier. And that modifier is either going to be plus one, two, three, four, or five, or it's going to be minus one, two, three, four, or five. And I usually do it on a 10 sided dice. Mm -hmm. And so basically, they know that even if they roll a 20, there's still some question about whether this thing is going to work out the way that they might want it to work out. And I love that because that gives more mystery and discovery and uncertainty. And that makes the game better, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So this this is all that's in the house rules. I think they're pretty good. If you get a chance, uh, Mildred, go download them and, and check them out. I'd love to right. get your opinion. All right. I now obviously I won't be able to do that in the mi- in the middle of the show, but I will. De- I will definitely. Okay. Um, I will definitely give my my own take, especially since um, I have been noticing a very interesting pattern within the within the third party develop development end of um, of D anD D fifth edition. And that is that is pe- that is people trying to go out of their way to lo- to um, lower the scaling. There's been a, there's been a complaint for the last few years of D and D getting a, of D and D fifth edition getting a little superhero-y, and I and I'm seeing pe- I'm seeing people try and amend that issue. Um, a big example of the a bit of this that I'm that I'm very familiar with, and in the interest of full disclosure, the guy behind it is a friend of mine, is um, Low Fantasy Gaming from Pickpocket Press. Um, and then there's, st- there's, stuff like, there's stuff like the Nightfell camp- campaign setting and a, whole, and a whole host of other things that are trying to um, make the low end. And, I'm, and when I say low end, I, I'm specifically referring to um, levels, one, levels 1 through 10. Um, some people go have a, have an even lower threshold, but that's usually where I draw the line. When it comes when it comes to referring to low end, and what it ultimately t- what ultimately tells me is that a lot of a lot of people are wisening up to the fact that fantasy gaming is a much wider net than pe- than people think. Like, I remember, I remember a long time ago. My mentor had my mentor had said to me, "Oh, had said when I said, okay, I I want to run, I want to run a, fa- I want to run a fantasy game." And he he immediately scoffed at me and said, "Okay, what kind?" <laughs> it's like, are we go? Are you going Tolkien? Are you going Conan? Are you going somewhere in the middle? Are you going to do pirates? Are you get? Are you going to do it in Europe? Are you going to do it further east, west? Pick a lane. Um. And it could be argued that the that the push towards low fantasy might be due to the popularity of games like The Witcher series or shows like Game of Thrones. Um, I'm not at, I'm I'm not at liberty to guess as to whether that's the case. Wouldn't be wouldn't surprise me if it if it was a factor though. But it's but it's def, it's definitely an interesting. Um, trend. Now, the, speaking of that, that brings me to the set to the setting that you that you have first with the Red Star Rising campaign, which was when you were designing it. Was what did you have the intent intent at the beginning to do one that is is leaning not necessarily horror but um, spook. Or if I or if I wanted to go a bit further, um, maybe gothic horror. So so you are spot on. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, I sort of describe Zayathe as a little bit of a mix of high fantasy and and medieval fantasy, right? Um, 
because I do agree with you that, that I just I don't want these characters getting out of control. One of the spells that I hate is teleport. In fact, mm -hmm. um, I, because I love travel, right? I just love people walking places or riding places because all kinds of things can happen when they're going between point A and point B. Mm -hmm. When you have teleport spells and all portals and all this kind of stuff, you just don't travel between point A and point B anymore, right? So, um, so anyway, so so a little bit of high fantasy, a little mm -hmm. bit of medieval fantasy, uh, a little gothic horror and a little eldritch horror, which yeah. people go, wait a minute, how are you doing that? But trust me, it's it's there. Mm -hmm. And then just a touch of steampunkiness, but steampunkiness in regards to because of the, the flow stones that are, have been created since the War of Ruin, which are magic incarnated uh, into these toxic gems, right? Mm -hmm. Because in Zyothe, magic has been corrupted. It has been um, affected by the nether flow. And it's, it's complicated. I don't want to go all mm -hmm. into it and bore people. But uh, maybe it wouldn't. But uh, um, but you know you have a show. We don't need to sit here and talk about that for the next half hour. <laughs> but anyway, I believe that you are correct. That, that a little less uh, a crazy magic is better. Sort mm -hmm. of a, a little more you know mundanity. Uh, because because otherwise, if everything is really crazy magical, there's nothing special about magic anymore. It's just mundane, right? It's yeah. mundane. So, so I tend to lean more middle of the road there. I wouldn't say I'd go as low as Game of Thrones. Uh, the Witcher is kind of uh, getting closer, but mm -hmm. uh, but even there, um, you know, they had some pretty good magic in there. I would say when you really yeah. look at the, the wizards, you know, they had some pretty good magic. I, mm -hmm. I'd say probably we're more there than than something where you know just everybody's casting spells and everything runs by magic and all that kind of stuff. I think we're sort of uh, in that direction. I, that I think it's better. So yeah. I guess I guess a long story short, I agree with you. That that's uh, that's more the style and probably a preferable style, honestly. And and I'm guessing in that same in that same vein, would you would you say that your particular style of fa style of fantasy with that campaign has more in line with Eastern Europe than Western? So we tried what we tried to do with Verdestia, which is the first continent, mm -hmm. is we did try to really. Uh, live in in a, a breadth of a mashup of Europe, right? And mm -hmm. and so there's definitely some Eastern European stuff, and you'll definitely see a lot of Eastern European as you move into uh, and even uh, uh, Russia, right? Uh, mm -hmm. As you move into uh, in the Slavic countries, as you move into uh, East Vodestia, mm -hmm. and so we we really tried to mash it up, and and part of our goal is to have a Vodestia sort of be based on sort of that lore, the the, the monsters, the, the the legends and those things, obviously created for Verdestia, not based like, like making it Europe, but mm -hmm. sort of inspired by that. Because when we moved to Sundestia, which is south of Verdestia and a bit more like Africa, mm -hmm. a bit more like India and Egypt sort of all mashed up together, we want different monsters there. We want different mm -hmm. creatures there. We want different ecology there. We want different culture there mm -hmm. because we really want people when they travel from sort of this uh, Verdestia thing that feels like uh, Eastern Europe to Western Europe and a little bit of the Slavic thing in Russia and all that stuff sort of all mangled together. We want them to move down mm -hmm. to this Sundestia. We want them to feel very much culture shock and, and really have that whole area be inspired by uh, Egyptian mythology and and uh, African myth uh, mythology and and even uh, near near Eastern Indian mythology and all of that stuff, because we really think that that will make uh, make the the world more interesting. Mm -hmm. So we literally are going to our plan is to have a monster manual for each continent uh, that will be quite different. Because one of the things I never liked was I felt like I fe wherever I went I ran into the same monsters, and that is something we are definitely changing uh, in in Zyothe. I don't know if that answered your question, Milgro, yeah, but <laughs> it did. And um, it's funny oh, you mention <laughs> it's funny you mention um, it's fun it's fun it's funny you meant it's funny you mentioned teleport because um, there are there are certain spells that in most campaigns I have had on my um, ban list, as in as in. You are not. You are not going to be taking that spell, and do not try and talk me talk me into it. I ain't bending on this. Um, if you want, if you'd have an easier time trying to move a mountain. <laughs> um, one of the, um, one of the, one of the, 
and most of the most of the spells that are on that list are think are things like scry, think things like t things like teleport or wish. Think the general rule is any spell that could potentially take away narrative control or dip into uh, or dip into um, other characters are not allowed. Like even even knock, you know, the or spells like that are on the ban list because I felt that do I felt that doing that would be dipping into the territory of thieves. Like, why well, have a thief? Who, why have a thief who can do who can um, do lock picking when you can have when you can have somebody just cast that spell and the problem's already fixed? Um, it's that I don't like having some having somebody's um, tool set be rendered redundant. I did make a small exception once for um, te for teleport, where I said you can cast this spell. But there's two catches. One, the only way to cast it safely is within certain um, ley lines. If you try and cast it anywhere else, you are, you are playing a very, very dangerous game of craps because you're effectively flying blind. I, descri I described it as... Um, as, as the as the uh, the uh, world of mana being akin, being akin to ri being akin to rivers full of rivers and oceans full of currents, and you need to understand where those currents go and where they drop off, in order to um, in order in order to actually get to the other side safely. You get caught in a current. Best case scenario, you end up in the wrong place. Worst case scenario, you end up teleporting right in the middle of into a rock. So, right. <laughs> so it's a case of you can do that. You can do that teleport spell if you if you want to, even if you're even if you're not in a safe area. But um, I take no responsibility for what happens afterward. Um, but things like things like scry, I I didn't I didn't care I didn't care for 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 similar reasons. Plus, um, with some with some of those spells, and you've probably seen this. You end up having to make other spells that that are designed to counter that one spell, which just adds more adds more bloat. And there's been a problem of spell bloat for years. Well, and the thing mm -hmm. is that for me, mm -hmm. what you said was very poignant. Things that take away narrative, um, that really kind of spoil. Listen, you know, everybody jokes about uh, about Gandalf when he mm -hmm. when he's about ready to fall off the cliff and he says you know fly you fools right mm -hmm. and many people say he's telling them to run and then other people say no he's telling them to go to the eagles right and um and god what a boring book that would have been if frodo and and uh <laughs> and sam had just jumped on a bunch of eagles flown to the mountain thrown the ring in and then flown back you know that would have been kind of boring so you know travel to me is is so wonderful and important and also cool in terms of making the world real. And in particular in chapter three, when the, the Hanatas troop departs the area that they have been at where they ran their last carnival and some interesting things happened, when they depart that area, they actually get to experience things on the road and not just an encounter, not just some monster jumping out of the woods at them. They go by the crooked tower, which they don't go visit because it's too far mm -hmm. away. And the troop is like, we ain't got time to do that. You know, mm -hmm. we're going on, right? And um, and uh, they they get to uh, they get to see certain things that are that are sort of landmarks. They they they'll meet Myron the Ugly Troll, who's the the head on the uh, on the uh, on Farley's Bridge, mm -hmm. right? And there's a whole tale and lore about about Myron the Ugly Troll. Mm -hmm. uh, there's even a song. And, and so all of a sudden you're traveling and all of a sudden the world feels so much more real than if you're just like, okay, I'm in this town, let's go to that town, right? And mm -hmm. uh, boop, we go to that town. And so that's why for me, you know, teleport is, an, is a, is a no, non-starter because I want people to travel. Yeah. Um, but I agree with you, mm -hmm. Wish is goofy. Uh, wish should have probably never been um, a, a ninth level spell. Um, and there are some others that are just, uh, they kind of, they kind of spoil, uh, the, the challenge of the game. That's one of my people know I have an inside joke at our gooey den, right? Because people mm -hmm. know I hate warlocks, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't really hate them. They're marvelous, uh, character class, but I do think it's absolutely, um, 
disturbing that a class can walk into a room, cast, uh, detect magic at will, and know everything that's magical within the room. And of course, so in my house rules, there's a number of things that counter that because I think that the, anything that messes with the opportunity for discovery and mystery, I don't want that in my game either. I want characters to be able to discover things and find things and miss things if they make mistakes. And that that is all part of the of the of the wonderment of actually living the game because you do make mistakes, you do miss things, mm -hmm. you don't have everything go perfectly your way all the time, and that's part of the challenge of it and part of the fun, right? Yeah. Um, now, when it comes to when it comes to the whole the whole thing with detect with detect magic, um, I have I've had my own I've had my own spin with that kind of thing, and one one of them is the fact that detect ma det on you know, a theme that you'll see with a lot with a lot of how I do things is that there's always a catch. When I a rule that I have is anybody who's a spell casting class has det has detect magic uh, has detect magic on constantly. But here's here's where the catch comes in. Depending on depending on the magic that they detect, they may end up having a reaction to it. You know you've seen you've no doubt seen Star Wars, so you know the whole I've got a bad feeling about this. Yes, of course. That kind of feeling is essentially amplified. Where somebody might have a bad feeling, they'd have to um They'd have to make. They'd have to roll to make sure that they don't start. They don't start freaking out because they're feeling that more intensely than everybody else. The whole idea is you, is by being some sort of spellcaster, you're opening a chance. You are effectively a conduit to these otherworldly powers, and that openness goes both ways. So, for me. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, sorry, I just got a text, but no. we won't worry about that right now. No for worries. me, no uh, I, I, you are you and I are just walking different roads for the same to the same direction, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know what you're trying to do is to make them not just use detect magic all the time at will, right? And uh, so that it's so there's a consequence to it. So mm -hmm. I, I agree with that. That's uh, mm -hmm. same thing with with resurrection and and these other. Uh, that's another house rule that I didn't mention. You can mm -hmm. look at what we do with that. We make make it a little harder for people to get resurrected and and uh so that so that not because we like killing uh characters we don't uh I actually don't, don't you're not like tomb of horrors <laughs> yeah no that's not i don't make those kinds of things at all i don't think they're fun um but but for what you were saying in terms of of a method for sort of making detect magic a little more difficult to use is exactly where i am i i just don't i want it to be um I want the mystery of discovery, right? I want the the enjoyment of finding things. I want the and I don't want them to just be automatically found. So I do a lot of little things to kind of mess with detect magic, uh, in particular because of the new the new warlock class that can detect mm -hmm. it at will. So yeah. it sounds like you do the same thing. You just do it differently than I do. So yeah, we we walk in the same road. Yeah, and what um when it comes to when it comes to something like wish, I will admit I did use that once. But there, w but there was a cost. Because, be and the ra the rationality that I went with was one: it wasn't something that was cast; it was on a it was on a scroll at the end of a campaign. And two, um, if you ever are you familiar with the phrase "nature abhors a vacuum"? Uh huh. Yeah, of course. Karma is an is in a similar mesh is in a similar fashion. If you try and mess with the rules of karma, with the rules of karma or the rules of fate, it will be very, very spiteful. So if you if you try and if you try and use your by using something like wish, you are effectively messing with someone's fate directly, and fate is go fate is going to get back at you in one form or another. So what what they ended up what ended up happening is somebody used used wish to um, prevent a dragon from existing. And they and they ended up get they ended up getting a lot of accolades and ended up getting end up getting um, a lordship, and then years later they were assassinated mm. because karma always always collects. 
Now, now right. I didn't do it out of spite. They knew they knew that they knew that by using it there was going to be some consequence. Well, obviously you you took a, a good direction as well. Um, you know, I just for me, I, I just want challenge, mm -hmm. right? If you really think about it, in the end, that's all I'm striving yep. for at my table. And again, yep. there's a hundred ways to run these things, right? You mm -hmm. know, the, the, there's there's really no right or wrong answer. It's what do you enjoy at your table and what do your yep. players enjoy, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, for me, I think the best games come from a deep, uh, very uh, multi-layer plot lines with all kinds of surprises and twists that are layered over the top with the player characters being sort of central to the entire you know thing that's going on um and then uh and then having lots of challenges lots of mysteries lots of strange things going on that they you know they have to you know go to point a to point b back to point b, back to point a back over to point c over to point d then back to point b and kind of moving them around a lot and and just having a lot of things going on that ultimately begin to tie together. And as they tie together, these players have these aha moments, you know, they kind of give you the chills up the spine, right? The mm -hmm. proverbial chills. Yeah. And yeah. I find that that game is the most enthralling game that, uh, that I've, that I've played, you know, with, with players. So, yeah. but you know, it, but it's all, it's all opinion. Some folks mm -hmm. just want to play, you know, good combats, you know, they mm -hmm. just want to run lots of combats and that's great fun too. Right. Some people mm -hmm. just want to, run around and be murder hobos and they laugh and have a few beers and eat some pizza and just have a wonderful night. And there's nothing wrong with that either. You know, beer and pretzels, beer and pretzels. is a part, is a part of the lexicon for a reason. And <laughs> I've some, um, sometimes, I, and sometimes I've outright leaned into it. That's why I, um, I had way too much fun with the X crawl idea, which want, which went on the notion of, Hey, let's take, let's take the idea of doing dungeon delving and let's make it into a full on reality TV show. Like the like like D like D and D meets the Running Man or something like that. Um. Now you've in, now you've um you've introduced two you mentioned introducing two classes into into the um into the into the sandbox with the spell dancer and the agent of Jinx. Yes. Now one thing I'm one thing I'm curious about is there's. There's a the, I have I have of course seen the fixation that Wizards of the Coast has with just adding more subclasses, and everybody has their own reasoning for for putting in new classes within the um, expansions that they've put out. Was the was the reasoning for putting out the those two new those two as new classes instead of new subclasses? Was it because the concepts that you had in mind didn't fit any of the existing classes? To some degree, I mean, the spell dancer is very unique, and it and it was designed to be part of sort of the Hanatas lore, mm -hmm. uh, and so that's kind of that's kind of where where the spell dancer came from. Yeah. What's going on with the agent is is sort of the beginning of of a belief set that we have, um, and that belief set is that uh, we would like religion to play a more interesting and intriguing part in uh, the world of Zayathe. Um, We've all played in, in games where there are, you know, literally hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of gods and mm -hmm. more show up all the time. And, you know, you start off with a pantheon and then 20 more gods and 20 more gods. And then there's these gods over here that nobody knew about. And, and nobody really gets to know the gods at all. Also, you know, you got to believe that that any order that has priests that can cast the kind of, of, of spells that these, these priests can cast as they go up, and certainly even at lower levels, if they can go heal, you know, a lord or heal a lady or save, you know, save some, you know, some mayor or whatever, right? Uh, these people are going to have power. They're going to have a lot of power. And so in the world of Zayathe, we sort of looked at power groups as sort of being an important aspect of the politics and all the things that go on. And we sort of landed on that definitely would be the governments, which, you know, are going to be very powerful. Uh, and they're going to have their, you know, their militaries and they're mm -hmm. probably going to have their own battle wizards and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, they're going to be the guilds. Uh, which are the people who make things and do things. And that could include a wizard's guild, right? Mm -hmm. That could include 
a bunch of sorcerers that got together, but it could be also a bunch of stonemasons, so to speak, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so the merchants, right? The people who make the money and the, the, the make the, the make everything run, right? Mm-hmm. And then there's the religious uh, aspects. And so we we are, you know, if, if everything keeps going and Gooey Cube can have the success we hope for, and we think it will, uh, it's already doing well. Um, mm-hmm. And we did that without conventions this year, which kind of blew our mind. Um, if we can keep going, uh, the Cyclopedia Religica will uh, not just uh, showcase the 72 gods of Zayathe and then the, the four lords of corruption and then the the nine that are returning. That's a, mm-hmm. that's the eldritch part. Mm-hmm. Um, it will not just showcase that. Uh, it will also showcase quite a number of new uh, uh, classes and, and, and archetypes. So we've never liked the fact, we never liked anti-paladin in the first place. Thank God they finally did away with that a little bit because paladin and anti-paladin was really kind of dopey. Um, Mm -hmm. So we have paladins and these are the servants of the good gods who are the the champions. The champions of the good gods are called paladin. The champions of the neutral gods are called egalitan. Mm -hmm. And the champions of the evil gods are called depravants. Because again, it never made really sense to us was how come... You only could have lawful good paladins and chaotic evil paladins. You know, this is just kind of didn't make sense to us, right? Mm-hmm. And so we were able to sort of uh, 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 expand upon that. And we also have virtually every uh, religious uh, god uh, has a, a, mo- a monk a monk order, a, a monasterial order. Mm-hmm. So monks are not necessarily sort of Eastern like they've sort of been portrayed. You know, there's. There's monks in, in, in all of these, most of these religious orders. And then there are others as well. There are warders and agents and uh, assassins. And so we're really sort of going to change, I think, the paradigm quite dramatically of sort of how religious orders work and their structures and, and really make them into, into the power groups that, they, that in our minds they would be. So we're excited about that. Um, we'll see. Uh, we'll see where it goes. Now, given what you mentioned about monks, um, obviously that's obviously that's going to raise my eyebrow, because for a lot of for a lot of people, um, they play a monk character, not be not nec- mostly because of the, mostly because of wanting to replicate the whole martial thing, and because of that, sometimes I've split it off from. From um, from um, monk in the traditional sense to just martial artist for those who just who just want to, just want to have their just want to have their kung fu and that's it. Um, but when it comes to the approach that you have with with monastic orders, um, do you do you foresee the possibility of put of putting in at the very least subclasses to ref, to reflect that not all of them are just going to be hand to hand experts? So sure, there's there's a lot of room to move, and when you start really looking at uh, at monasterial things, I, you know, again, we're we're still some ways away from this, but absolutely, I I I, I think that uh, you know being able to if you look at at, at uh, not just far eastern. Uh, uh, sort of uh, monasterial orders. If you look at Central and South American monasterial orders, or you look at sort of even the traditional monasterial orders of Europe, you know, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the, you know, D and D sort of did a, a little bit of a disservice by, by sort of um, pigeonholing them into sort of this far Eastern sort of concept. Um, I do under, I do understand, I understand why it happened. And it, it's ma- it's mainly due to, a lot of things that ended up being traditions with D and D is a ca- is a case of um, or what the creators happen to be fans of, and in the case of monks, it has more to do with somebody at TSR or, or what have you being a fan of the Destroyer novels. Uh, interesting. Yeah, interesting. Well, you know, I mean, for me, for me, there's just so much more room to move. Uh, you know, if you if you really just look at monasterial orders and say, you know, monasterial orders have these certain sets of powers, these certain sets of abilities, these certain sets of skills, right? Mm-hmm. But it doesn't necessarily mean that your monk has to just fight with a stick, you know. So, 
or just punch people, you know, mm-hmm. but, uh, but we'll see, we're going to cross that bridge in the future. I kind of like uh, your thought there um, that maybe we broaden it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we'll see, kind of see where that goes. Yeah. Especially, especially since the, obviously the main reason that some um, now, of course, the, of course there are philosoph- philosophical and spiritual reasons why um, fighting techniques would be practiced in, mona- in monastic temples, but there's also more practical reasons of not wanting to deal with bandits or dealing with people who think that they can get a um, a, fr- a um, free score by t- by raiding a temple. Uh, yeah, no, right. No, you're, you're right. Uh, I apologize. I was uh, thinking about that as you said it there. But yes, I, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, what do you think? Do you think that, I mean, if you had your druthers, how, where would you take it? What would you do? When it com- when it comes to when it comes to doing a uh, mona- doing a monastic temple, yeah, yeah. Um, I, for for me, I've had I've had a bit of an approach with quote unquote div- with quote unquote divine um, classes. Um, the clerics are the are the left hand of the of the pantheon. They're they're the ones who. Are are in charge of keep of keeping the well being of the of the faithful. The paladin is the right hand. It's their their job is not to help the faithful. It's to uh, it's to def- it's to defend the um, faithful from attack. Avengers, which which um, was a concept that was introduced in fourth edition, and I've used um, in some as a more offensive paladin variant in fifth. Are the, are those who are the attackers? They're the, they're the ones who went who strike out at what the pantheon considers its enemies. In when it comes to when it comes to monks, the approach that the approach that I've I've taken is that they is that they are they are um in a they are in a kind of go they're in a kind of go between. Because because there because I wanted to do away with the whole idea of the monk being sequestered in their t- in temples, mm-hmm. and a big and more of the case of the of the monk is is far is um what will be seen more often by the by the common folk. Um, I will admit one of the big inspirations is the concept of the beggar sect that's in a lot of wuxia um projects. As well as as well as certain um, more earthly st- more earthly styles of monk that are very associated with villages or, or the like, um, and that's simply because the, that's simply because of the fact that the stereotype of the monk sequestered in a temple way way off far away from civilization, you end up having the you end up having the uncomfortable question you need to answer of why they leave the temple. And while sometimes that can lead to that can lead to good um, a good role playing situation, a lot of times you end up with you end up with a situation where they're go- where um they're go- where they're going to be they're going to have the fresh off the boat problem, like they're like they're like they're um I guess the way I can put it is the pro- is having the country guy move into this move into the city, and. It kind of bottlenecks what you can do with the concept of a monk. Well, absolutely. I mean, there's certainly a place for for um, what would you call them uh, reclusive monastic orders, but there's yeah. also definitely a place for you know monks that live right in the middle of the city and are taking care of the poor or defending you know certain holy places or whatever mm-hmm. you know that. You know, this is right. This is the idea of having a little more flexibility and a little more breadth, right? It makes yeah. it makes it better for character development, makes it better for for the enjoyment of the game, and makes it more interesting for the players in general, right? Yeah, a um, a big thing with my philosophy is is that is not ha- is not having assumptions when it comes to when it comes to certain classes. Um, the big offender when it came when it came to this was bards because everybody gets hung up on the idea of a bard having to be a musician. I don't agree that it that that necessarily has to be the case and I think that 
just focusing on them playing an instrument takes away from the bard the bardness of what bards are. I've of, I've often said that the um that my that um bards at the end of the day are storytellers, not musicians. Yeah, think, they are lore they are lore carriers. But yeah. you know, that has been twisted a little bit over time. But I don't disagree with you. Um I'm I'm more in your camp that uh the carrying of lore and the knowing of lore and being able to entertain and all of these things sort of weave in, you know. Yeah. yeah. I had I had once met I I had once made the remark that um, Varric Tethras is probably the best bard that I'd seen in a um, vi- in a video game concept, and he doesn't play an instrument. He's but what he does have are a whole lot of sto- a whole lot of stories. He knows how to talk his way out of situations, and he's somebody who has been around. Yes, exactly. That's right, and and they've seen things, and they've learned things and they have uh uh traveled and they know they know more than you right they come to your village and there's all kinds of stories that they're going to tell that people who've never gone more than five miles from their you know their residence have no clue about right yeah and 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 while while um while sto- while stories were conveyed very easily in the in the past through um music it doesn't mean that that it has to be the the uh, case um correct and even and even if you do you, even if you do go with it at the at the very least can i have can i have somebody play a bard who's use, who's using something other than a string instrument for once <laughs> but that that's just a pet peeve of mine cuz there's there's plenty of uh, there's plenty of other instruments that that can be used and um I know well you could make the joke about 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 a string about a, a a string instrument being useful for when somebody wants to smash the guitar but um that joke that joke is only going to work once well it lets them talk right at the same time for using pipes Makes it a little harder to be able to talk at the same time. I want for I want at least once where somebody plays a bard and is coming in with the loudest fucking Scottish bagpipes the world has ever seen. <laughs> talk about knocking some people over. <laughs> yes. Now, when now um, when it comes to when it, when it comes to the box sets and when it, when it came to um. You mentioned now. You mentioned being annoyed by by having to track um, magic items and and track and tracking the stats for equipment. Um, is that what is that one of the main reasons why putting the, putting those kind of things in card form was implemented? And what and when you in your early days did you have a box of index cards? Yeah, I did. I used to throw cards at people, um, and then I did went to post it notes. Uh, and post-it notes were awesome because I could just have them stuck there ready to go, right? Mm-hmm. And then just hand them the post-it note, but then they'd invariably lose the damn post-it note. And, you know, so, but, but really what it is, is the wonder, the wonderfulness of a card mm-hmm. is that it has all the stats on it all ready to go. I don't have to deal with it, but it's also got this wonderful image, right? It's got a, it's got a picture. Mm-hmm. And, and I, you know, I, even though I am a writer, I can't draw to save my life. I do believe a picture really is worth a thousand words. Mm-hmm. And I think that pictures do help many people, not all people, because some people can be there just in their mind's eye, but they really help many people to be there a little more. And so rather than now I'm giving something physical to someone, that physical thing actually has a picture of the the, the item upon it, has the stats on the back. And I even can tell them, just be clear, if you don't have that card, you don't have that item which means that you probably left it somewhere, which is going to be a real problem. So make sure you take care of your cards. And people mm-hmm. also tend to take care of them a little better when they have those. And um, I've even given out little um, uh, plastic, you know, uh, things that they can put their cards into to kind of keep track of them. And then when they sell them, I can take the cards back. And so it really does, uh, it does aid uh, immersiveness at a host of different levels, you know? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> And I'm ge- I'm guessing it's this I'm guessing it's the same thing when it comes to put it, when it comes to putting in reminders for certain NPCs, especially since would it be fair of me to say that 
there's, for for lack of a better term, a motley crew of characters in each chapter. Oh, uh, especially in the Darkest Dream. The Darkest Dream is is about Carnival, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of uh, interesting individuals. Yes, but they are in every chapter. Yes, we we tend to uh, if there's going to be interaction, there's going to be a lot of, of non-player character portraits. Mm -hmm. And I love portraits because I have used them for years as a tool for myself to help me to, to I put notes on the back of the portrait that are right there. If something really weird happens with that character, you know, out of the blue, the rogue decides, you know, he or she is going to just, uh, you know, uh, pickpocket out of the blue, this, 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 this kindly old priest, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, for no reason, right? You know, poor old priest. They got a lot of money. They're doing great. And just, just going to pick this poor old priest pocket, right? Mm -hmm. And the priest catches them. And now all of a sudden there's a little enmity. And so I, I put that down there. I never have to remember that in some kind of notes someplace, right? I, mm -hmm. I don't ever. I just, it is always with the non-player character. And I have found that to be so helpful to me. So I don't have to go back and try to find some line somewhere where it says, Poor old priest tried to get pickpocketed by dirty dog Roe, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Didn't like it very much. <laughs> never play... Never play... Always be... I'm not going to say never, but always... Be always be always careful be with, careful pl with play playing play with play kleptomaniacs play. around. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I think I, I think we've all had at least one case of somebody who has to try and pull, who has to try and pull every single switch in the dungeon and then act surprised when they get in trouble. Yeah, right. <laughs> Wait a minute, that's not fair. <laughs> um, I know that life in the par life of the party made a uh, made a gag out of that, which is a really is a really and is a really funny um role playing ga role playing game cartoon. I should note. Um, it's kind, it's kind of, in the, of it, but I've got to check it out. It's kind of in the it's same kind of vein the same as Order of the Stick. Okay. I'll have to take a little mm -hmm. peek. Yeah. Now, when it, oh, um, when it comes to, in, when it comes to encounters, which is, which is where a lot, which is where a lot of the looking up thing ends up really being a factor, um, did... Did you ha did you have it set up where when it comes to each chapter where there are going to be certain encounters at certain parts of the story or do you have a grab bag of of monsters for that particular area? It's both. So there are preset uh, events and encounters that are going to happen if they visit certain areas, mm -hmm. and then there are. Um, I, I don't believe in random encounters. Uh, we call them not so random encounters, actually, at GUI Cube NSREs, mm -hmm. because I, I found that random encounters often en uh, become kind of goofy. They don't fit always with the story. And so we do not so random encounters that are more GM discretionary. And there are actually three types there are lethal ones where they actually can come in co into combat, there are non lethal ones that are more event based and interesting based and, and more. Um, something happens that is not necessarily involving combat. And then there are these little things we call GUI additions. And GUI additions are just, just an interesting little thing that happens that may be very tangential to the story or maybe kind of involved in the story, but man, are they get people going, whoa. You know, they, they find something in the dirt that has a note on it that references one of the character's relatives or something, you know, that's like, I mean, it's just really, you know, those kinds of things that get people at the table going, what the heck does that mean? You know? Mm -hmm. So, I, so both is definitely the answer. Also, all of our, um, all of our encounters, all of the, the creatures, monsters, the antagonists, whoever they are, we've already level balanced the adventure for the game master. So every, uh, every encounter, every creature has four different factors uh, figured into that creature. The first one is weaker party. The second one is advanced party. The third one is make it tough. And the fourth one is make it tougher. Mm -hmm. and the reason why we do that is because, I, I, as you know, Mildred, most game masters know, uh, one game master's table's level three is another game master's table level five. Right, because mm -hmm. how much magic do you give out? Do you do, do you do heroic style at the beginning? And these guys got five, all got five, five eighteens, you know, all this kind of stuff, and blah 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 blah. Or are you running a very you know low magic environment with, 
you know, average hit points and all this kind of stuff. And then beyond that, are your players, you know, have they been playing for 20 years and they they run their flipping uh, their flipping characters like Navy SEALs, right, mm-hmm. all over the place, they're just perfect, right? Mm-hmm. Or are they a bunch of newbies that don't really know what they're doing? And so that can, you know, that th- that can make a, a, a first level, sorry, a third level encounter very, very difficult for a bunch of fifth level characters and, uh, and make it not that hard at all for a bunch of first level characters. So, you know, we, we felt that, um, that this sort of idea that this is for level, you know, level two, right? Level two to three, right? Mm -hmm. is kind of a misnomer. And so what we did was we went in there and really tried to make each one of these encounters having some uh, scale so that you can scale it as the game master and you can literally do it on the fly. And we think that's a, a real big help. Uh, to to game masters in terms of events and encounters and all that stuff. So NSREs and level balanced uh, events or excuse me encounters, I think uh, really really help. All right. Now, given the given the way you described your encounter setup, would it be fair of me to say that you don't necessarily use um um challenge rating all that often? No, not necessarily. Um, First of all, again, the math is the math, but the the math is 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 very much affected by uh, player skill, uh, how game masters play monsters. I mean, you know, Mildra, we mm-hmm. we can play monsters one way, and they are going to you know a bunch of kobolds is going to be a really really tough tough situation, and if we don't play a dragon right, the dragon go down easy, you know. So mm-hmm. so you know it, it's really. There's a whole host of things that go into that uh, beyond just the math of challenge rating, in my opinion, you know. Mm-hmm. And when it comes, it's fun. It's funny you mentioned that because um, I remember I distinctly remember um, my players learning the lesson to not underestimate me when they when they saw, oh, we're de- we're dealing with a bunch of kobolds. They they thought, oh, <laughs> oh, that's not going to be much trouble at all. They didn't realize that the kobolds were using team tactics. They knew how to ambush. They um, they were they were at the same relative level that they that they were, and they were relatively low level. But they were think they were thinking that they could just steamroll through it. But no, they kept doing hit and run tactics. They kept whittling away at them, and they and we ended up with a TPK in the process no. because they got cocky. <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. <laughs> That is exactly right. So, no, this, I mean, this this is the thing, right? All we're talking about right now, how marvelous this game can be yeah. and, and how much joy it can bring and so much fun. And mm-hmm. uh, But every table is different, right? Every group of players is different. You know, it's, uh, you know, I uh, I tell people all the time that, uh, you know, there's so many things we should we should not be, be so concerned about, you know, this... Mm-hmm. Uh, this idea of railroadiness versus sandboxiness, right? Uh, uh, it's it's there are very few game masters in the world who have the the real ability to improvise a really deep, really thoughtful, very twisty plot line with multiple subplots and all kinds of crazy things going on from the sides and keeping track of all of that stuff and. And really being able to do it, it's just, it's a, it's the people that do it, I am in awe awe of them. And I think I'm a pretty good improviser. Mm -hmm. Um, But, but to, to not think that you, you, you don't want to have some predetermined things that are made ahead of time um, is not unreasonable. There's, there's no reason why there isn't a place in your world that exists, whether the players go there or not. And that place does, has its own ecosystem and it has its own ecology and things happen there and they go on and on and on. And so I really live in sort of the in-between place because I actually believe some level of, of uh, path following uh, makes the game better. And, um, and, 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 and building p- plots and, and building tail that sort of, uh, you know, kind of where the players are going to go for me uh, is more entertaining for me and it's more entertaining for my table than just sort of having it just a free-for-all going wherever you want. But again, that doesn't really matter because that's great for me but it might not be great for someone else. And if they prefer a very, you know, very railroady game or a very sandboxy game, and that's what they want to do, that's the marvelousness of it. Mm-hmm. And I sort of think we shouldn't get caught up in this idea of this way is better than that way, you know, because I don't believe that's true. I believe it, 
it's all relative based on on what people enjoy and what they like. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Eh. Because obviously, um, to I've I've made a rem, I've made a remark in the past that the worst joke I've ever heard is the idea that I the idea that I have any clue what I'm doing. <laughs> it's very good. <laughs> um, and I say it's a bad joke because jokes are supposed to be funny. Um, it made me chuckle. <laughs> I got it though. <laughs> yeah. The other the other thing, of course, is that no. And this is, and I will freely admit that when it comes to a lot of GM sections in core books, I um, ten, I tend to, I tend it. After reading so many books for for both my show and just in general, a lot of GM sections I I kind of um, gloss gloss over or I just zone out when it comes to reading the, those parts because of how the advice is very surface level, and eventually you've eventually you've hurt you you end up seeing repeats of what uh, what was mentioned. Um, when it comes to, when it comes, and if, but the thing is, is, is that no, no two GMs are alike. I could, I could probably, um, run, I could probably run chapter one, theoretically, with two different tables and get different results. Absolutely. Absolutely. And given and you what might you might mean- take them in different directions, mm-hmm. right? You might... Yeah. Might have played the first time you played it. You kind of like that was cool. I went that way, but I could have gone this way. Mm-hmm. I want to do it this way. <clears throat> oh goodness, excuse me. <clears throat> I could. I want. I want to go this way now. Mm-hmm. You know that. I mean, you get it. Mm-hmm. Um, and when it comes to do, when it comes to doing it in the in those different fashions, that leads me to one one question. I'm curious about. Given what you said about not so random encounters. What's your take on the idea of hex crawls? Well, you know, for me, you know, I'm okay with it. Mm-hmm. Um, I, because I'm really tail focused, um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to be, I don't, I, I, again, I don't want to ever throw shade because mm-hmm. I really believe that different strokes are for different folks and they can like different things. And, and you know, just because I happen to like something doesn't mean it's perfect for other people, you know? So, um, I have found that what, at least at my tables and many, many games that I have run, the things that seem to really engage the players are these really interesting tales that have all these different layers and all these different things going on. And they are having trouble, right? Because they're trying to put one and one and one together. They're trying to figure out A plus B equals C and all these different mysteries and all this stuff. And as those things are slowly revealed, they get more and more excited and more and more engaged and more and more scared oftentimes, right? And I find that to be more interesting than sort of just cruising around. But that's not entirely true because I also like travel. And when people are traveling, it's not really a hex crawl because I tend to know, I tend to know no matter which way they go on the route kind of things that are going to happen. Mm-hmm. I also definitely am, am one of those guys who, you know, if I want you to go to to this this uh, creepy old place, uh, and you're going north, you're going to probably run into the creepy old place when you're going north. If I want you to run into the creepy old place and you're going south, you're definitely going to run into the creepy old place going south, right? So I don't place it on the map beforehand, right? It it the map is fluid, right? The map mm-hmm. is just a uh, a method for me. So for me, hex crawls are interesting sometimes. But it's 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 even like running around a city, right? I, I love these sort of little encounter charts and you run around a city and just kind of see what happens, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and sort of those lead to adventures. But I tend to like a tale more. So I'm, you know, I'm sort of, um, I guess I'm saying they're okay for me, but I sort of like a, a, another way a little better. Is that fair? Yes. Yeah. I would I would say that I would say that is fairly fair. Yes, I know what I I know how I phrased that, and I'm not taking that back. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, running around just trying to explore is not a bad thing, right? No. I mean, that's that can be fun, you know. I, again, even mur- even crazy murder hobo game nights can be really enjoyable, yeah. especially if you've had a couple drinks, you know. Um, and I I will I will admit that. I uh, that when it comes to when it comes to doing the whole running running around for in that kind of thing. Um, 
I've done a few frontier frontier fantasy style approaches, or or just sur or just survive the wilderness because, well, one, I'm in I'm in the Midwest and I'm surrounded by trees and more trees. <laughs> and yes, you are. <laughs> and two, um, I w I was I was introduced at a very young age to to a, to an unwritten rule when it comes to fairy tales. Um, don't read don't read the original versions of fairy tales to your kids. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Creepy. <laughs> uh, I I read the Brothers Grimm long before I should have. <laughs> yeah, right. It's, it 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 can definitely affect you. <laughs> yeah, and the and the other factor is um one of the er one of the earliest computer games that I that I played growing up was the Oregon Trail. I remember it. Um, which is st is still one is still one of my is still my gold standard when it comes to doing an educational game. Mm -hmm. It was but fantastic. It's but it's with those sort no. with those sort of things you can do you can have plenty you even if you don't have a destination you can have you can have plenty of craziness just trying to survive this hostile area. And besides, Correct. there's all there's been the meme for the longest time that everything in Australia wants to kill you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like if that if that's not the if that's not the perfect example of of an exploration campaign, I don't know what is. Right, and and again, there's you know, like I'm saying, there's I, listen. I have had some nights where we just sat around and just laughed, mm -hmm. right? And they did bad things that they should have probably done, and it was just just what it was. And mm -hmm. you know, there's no, like I said, there's no really there's no one good way that is the only way. It's just, no, it's what you like. It's what you're in the mood for that night, and. You know, some nights, you know, some nights people are just not in the mood for being serious. They want to have fun, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's okay. Then let's have fun. Yeah. Now, with the, with all of that with all of that in mind. Now, first, like I said at the beginning, I do want to congratulate you on how on how well you on how well this um particular Kickstarter has come around, especially since you still got a you still got a ways before before it finishes. Um. What would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the digital versions and the physical versions, respectively? Now, I don't so mean a specific cool... date or, or week, but more, a, more of a month range, like first, second, third quarter, that kind of thing. Yeah, so the, the nice thing is that some of the stuff that people will pledge for is really available now. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we did, a, you know, some re-edits on chapters one, two, and three. Those are, those are pretty much going to be able to ship relatively quickly after the Kickstarter settles. Uh, the, the book one, the Cyclopedia Zyathica, which is our, our world lore book, it's called The Weirded World. Mm -hmm. That book is, is done and available. Um, the, the first book of the, the Verdestian continent, West Verdestia, uh, the Cyclopedia West Verdia, mm -hmm. uh, is 95% done. It's in layout. It just needs final proofing and editing and we can send that to the printer mm -hmm. um then we move to chapter four of the campaign which is i would say 80 percent done so that just needs to get laid out now you know and, and kind of proofread and that can go to the printer chapter five surprisingly has an awful lot of its artwork already done um much of the it's, it's actually our first real dungeon crawl it's a real dungeon crawl Mm -hmm. uh, for chapter five, I probably shouldn't say that's a bit of a spoiler, but um, <clears throat> it has uh, it has almost all of the rooms detailed. It has almost all of the the plot is the plot is solidified. All the weird things that are going on and fun things that are going on, um, but it does need to be polished up. It needs more writing added to it and such like that. Mm -hmm. So that'll be uh, that'll be a couple months out after the first of the year for sure, um, and then the the the. Cyclopedia Essenverdia, which is the East Verdestian continent. We're just beginning the writing of that with our writing team. And uh, and so that's going to be a few months out. And then the things that will be the furthest out are probably the, the city of Darkenhaven and the Gloomport. Um, you know, just doing the maps alone. We, we're finished, we finished one of the 17 by 22 map sections for Darkenhaven. And we're just about done with the, the 17 by 22 map of the first 17 by 22 map of the Gloomport. But I think those could take, you know, some months each to complete just the maps. Now, of course, we'll be doing the other things at the same time. But, uh, but the, you know, so it'll be a stage thing. And we have actually told people already that if they want to uh, sort of have their shipping go twice, 
mm-hmm. don't think it's that big of a, an impact on the cost. Um, so we can uh, we can work with people and then we'll get out the digital stuff, obviously, as quickly as possible for folks so they can have it uh, as soon as possible and, and let people you know be able to enjoy it. Yeah, I can. And I'll I'll um, now in the interest of disclosure, I will I will note that I ended up backing at the um, dip a toe in the goo level. You are marvelous. Um, and I'll be keeping a close a close eye on how on how the pro how the project develops, um, especially since some. Um, now you can you can blame you can blame J- you can blame James for to- for um, <laughs> partially talking me talking me into it, but it helped some um, further my own crusade. And the and I think that I think there's going to be a whole lot mo- a whole lot more. Um, interesting, th- interesting things to come of it. Um, well, I would be honored if you would run the Red Star Rising campaign for some people, my friend. I would be incredibly honored if you would do that. I, I, um, I am full. I am fully aware that event that it is only it is only a matter of time before I st- before I start seeing more opportunities to run things at um, small time conventions in my state. Yes. And because of the fact that I know it's a eventuality in one form or another, I have been sl- I've been slowly preparing. Plus, I um, plus even even with that, there's always the there. I'm I'm probably going I'm probably gonna be mo- migrating some of my old roll twenty stuff onto an, onto a platform like Foundry. Um. So uh, so it's. As my mentor would say, fortune favors the prepared. Yes, <laughs> that is one. That is one rule that Alphinius puts down. I, I, I have watched so many games, and I have played in so many games, and I have, uh, I've game mastered way more than I played, but I played in enough. Mm-hmm. And I can tell, and you can tell, and all of us can tell, even with a improvising game master, who who has prepared themselves who knows what sort of the lay of the land is mm-hmm. and who does not and if you haven't prepared you bore the snot out of your players it is yeah. it is almost inevitable uh mm-hmm. you know whether you are sort of preparing sort of an improvised thing or whether you're sort of uh preparing a much more structured thing uh, i really really tell people Spend the time to prepare. Spend the time to know the non-player characters that are going to come up in the game or potentially could come up in the game. Spend the time to know the localities that you have set and the localities that are not set. Understand what's going to happen there. Understand what's going to go on there. So you aren't sitting there having to turn and flip in the book and look at all kinds of you know things that you have to, that you that you had to do and just take away from the the action, right? Mm-hmm. And I I am convinced that that many game masters out there could improve their game dramatically just by spending a little more time in preparation. Oh yes. And with with all that with all that in mind, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come on to to come onto the show and come all the way up to the te- to the temple. This was a long hike. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, we did <Right> snow. <laughs> well, ne- next time, next time, I'll have to make sure you take the elevator. <laughs> I appreciate that, sir. I appreciate. <laughs> um, and of course, and of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, this has been marvelous. I I really enjoyed myself. Thank you for for such a wonderful time. And uh, and as I said, I really I'd love for you to get a table, mm-hmm. and I'd love for you to run the Red Star Rising campaign and and tell me what you think because I think I think it's going to blow your mind. Mm-hmm. I really do. I look I look forward I look forward to do to doing that. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure it will it will happen in do, in due time. Like I said, it's just all about patience. Of course. Um, but, and, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness, and there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, 
My name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs>